Welcome to today's podcast on the evolving landscape of the PBM industry. Uh, today's podcast will focus on the rise of PBMs and their role in drug pricing, as well as the increasing scrutiny of the industry at the, both the federal and state level. Uh, my name is Rujal Desai. I'm a partner in the healthcare and life sciences practice at Covington and Burling, based in Washington, D.C., where I lead a lot of the firm's work related to market access, drug pricing, reimbursement, um, contracting, and work with payers, uh, as well as policy efforts in this area, and have been doing this type of work for the last 20 years. And I'm excited to be joined by my former colleague, Kendra Roberson, who will provide a brief introduction of herself. Sure. Um, thanks, Rachel. I'm a partner um, in the Employee Benefits Group at Bakery, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath, and my practice focuses on representing large employers in the design and compliance of their employee benefit plans, including their health plans. And as you may know, large employers who sponsor health plans are some of the biggest customers of pharmacy benefit managers. And employers rely on PBMs and their economies of scale to obtain access to prescription drug discounts and rebates and pharmacy networks for their employees. So um, so I've been practicing in this area for 20 years and, and helping employers sort of navigate um, sort of their service provider rela relationships with, with PBMs. Great. Thanks, Kendra. And I think in addition to the life science companies that I represent and, and those that employers that, that Kendra represents, we hope this conversation will be of interest to, to those in the PBM industry, uh, you know, insurers, uh, those thinking about policy efforts in this area, uh, and, and just concerned about um, the issues of, of drug pricing and the role of, of different supply chain entities uh, overall. Uh, of course, the conversation today is is uh, those personal views of Kendra uh, and I, not those of our respective firms or clients. And we're really excited uh, to be partnering with uh, HLA on this podcast, partly because Kendra and I also got to partner with HLA on a recently released legal treatise uh, on market access, pricing, and reimbursement of drugs and devices. Uh, it's it's something that we're, we're quite excited about. We, think, we thought that there was a, a gap in the legal literature on these issues and worked together with a number of other co-authors uh, over the last couple of years to develop the treatise. And in particular, chapter five of the treatise focuses on the supply chain and the commercial channel. In particular, there's a significant discussion of the PBM industry, vertical integration of that industry, as well as uh, interesting diagrams and schematics of how uh, different portions of drug pricing get spread out throughout uh, the supply chain. And so we encourage you to, to think about uh, the treatise and, and take a look at the chapter uh, five in particular. And uh, with that as a springboard, uh, maybe I'll just start out by, for those that aren't as familiar with the PBM industry, making a, a, a brief statement about the fact that they're a critical player uh, in the supply chain uh, in terms of transactions uh, that facilitate pricing and reimbursement of innovative therapies. Uh, so, you know, they've had a history of being processor of claims. So at the pharmacy counter, helping pharmacies determine uh, beneficiaries' uh, coverage for a particular drug, what their cost sharing will be, helping to adjudicate that claim to make sure the right parties receive their respective level uh, of payment, um, as well as adding additional value in terms of drug-to-drug of -drug inter interaction alerts, and then over time, helping employers and insurers develop formularies uh, to cover certain drugs in a preferred or exclusive status over the years, also in, in increase that role to negotiate rebates uh, on behalf of, of their clients with pharmaceutical manufacturers and process those payments uh, as well. And then over the years, I've also grown to in include some PBMs, large retail or specialty pharmacy operations to act actually dispense drugs uh, to patients as well, and more recently have added GPO uh, affiliates to their um, to their vertical chain, uh, as well as you know, moving into a host of different areas. And in particular, there are, are three PBMs that have, have aggregated um, to, to really have a significant market share uh, and create that vertical integration. And it's partly because of that vertical integration and aggregation of market power that there's been uh, re particularly recent scrutiny um, on the industry. And so with that scrutiny is where I'll ask maybe Kendra to weigh in first to talk about uh, the FTC in particular 
uh, that currently has an open investigation. Uh, Kendra, if you could share sure. with the audience kind of an overview of what's going on, why is the FTC interested, what areas are they looking at, and what should we expect? Sure. So in June of last year, the FTC voted to conduct a market, market inquiry of the PBM industry and required you know, six largest PBMs to provide information and records regarding their business practices. And fast forward to this June, June of this year, the FTC expanded the investigation and issued compulsory orders to three group purchasing organizations or GPOs, which I know you mentioned, Rujal, but just to level set, um, these are sometimes called rebate aggregators. And these are the entities that negotiate rebates with drug manufacturers on behalf of PBMs and hold the contracts that govern those rebates. And so the FTC is now looking at GPOs as well as the initial um, six PBMs. And the FTC has stated that its inquiry is aimed at shedding light on several PBM practices, um, including charging fees and clawbacks to unaffiliated pharmacies, methods to steer patients to PBM owned pharmacies, potentially unfair auditing of unaffiliated pharmacies, um, the use of complicated pharmacy reimbursement methods and how negotiated rebates and fees with drug manufacturers impact the cost of prescription drugs. So they're sort of looking at all, all of these aspects um, of the drug chain, drug supply chain. Um, and I think most recently, one of the most interesting developments out of the investigation is that in July, the FTC, at least so far, um, is that in July, the FTC issued a statement warning the public not to rely on prior FTC advocacy statements and studies opposing mandatory PBM transparency and disclosure requirements. And one of the more interesting points in the statement was a note that in the past, the FTC was concerned that mandated disclosure requirements between PBMs and their customers, which are namely large employers and health plans, um, would encourage um, price coordination and collusion. Um, however, the ETF FTC is now of the view that, that, that the trends towards extensive consolidation by PBMs and extensive vertical integration by PBMs into the, um, into the entire drug supply and payment chain has put employers and other payers at a disadvantage. Um, and in both the marketplace, you know, and just in terms of the information that they have to make purchasing decisions. And so it's interesting because now the FTC in that statement has suggested that it's appropriate for policymakers to require PBMs to provide accurate and timely information for buyers. So I feel like now Congress and, you know, of course, state legislatures, as we're going to talk about, have sort of now, you know, picked up that um, picked up that mantle, you know, and they're now sort of, um, you know, pursuing those um, those um, initiatives. Right. I'd say that, you know, that that recent statement really kind of points out the FTC is saying, you know, historically, you know, perhaps they've been less active in pushing back on the vertical consolidation that, that basically took over 40 different companies and consolidated them into three uh, that, that you know, have by some measures 70, 80, 90 percent uh, of the market. And I think there's been an interest in, in at the Senate, a number of, of, of senators on a bipartisan basis have, have said to FTC publicly, you need to hurry up and finish your inquiry, right. um, you know, because we want to see the findings. And if you, you know, don't move fast enough, we're going to step in front of you and, and continue our own efforts because these issues are so, um, so paramount uh, in the, in the on drug pricing and costs uh, overall. And I think it's interesting that the FTC has also been looking at that these same, same vertical vertically integrated entities more as platform companies. In similar ways, they look at the technology industry as having platform companies and are there platform company type abuses uh, that are going on, on in the supply chain due to this vertical integration, uh, whether that's, you know, um, uh, predatory pricing or or you know, self-dealing or steering uh, using certain information that the platform has because it's it's facilitating all these transactions across the industry. And so I think everyone is eagerly anticipating the close of the inquiry, the report to be issued uh, likely you know by the spring, um, if not sooner. 
Uh, and then, you know, as has often happened happened in past FTC inquiries of this type, uh, there may be new investigations launched into one or more of the vertically integrated PBMs or public disclosure that there's already an ongoing investigation and, and here's where uh, it currently sits. Uh, but as I, uh, Kendra mentioned, uh, the uh, the Hill in particular has been active on this front. I think we've seen, you know, this past year, uh, you know, close to, to 30 different bills introduced in the House and, and Senate uh, taking on different aspects of, of PBM reform. And while, you know, in this podcast, we don't want to walk through every single one of those bills. I think as Kendra has, and I've discussed, there are certain themes that come out of of these bills, and and there's about half a dozen uh, that maybe I'll highlight, and then Kendra and I'll walk through uh, what what the policy goals are uh, with with each of those those types of themes. And so the, the half dozen or so are, are transparency reporting requirements, prohibitions on spread pricing, rebate pass through requirements, uh, restrictions on patient steering, uh, delinking of PBM fees to rebate amounts. Uh, and then additional government investigation and oversight authority over the PBM industry. So, Kendra, maybe you want to take the the first handful of those first and and give a lens on on what it is that policymakers at the federal level uh, are trying to achieve with 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 some of these bills that that mention those themes. Sure. Well, measures to increase PBM transparency are a common provision um, across the multiple bills aimed at PBMs, and I think this is one of the uh, measures that has the most bipartisan support, and we're likely to, if, if anything passes this fall, I think it definitely will get something on transparency. Um, the Senate Health Committee in May passed the Pharmacy Benefit Manager Reform Act, which would require disclosure of certain information and prohibit employers and health insurers from doing business with a PBM that fails to make those disclosures. And that seems to be sort of a common theme, theme among many of the of, of the bills. Um, the Senate Commerce Committee bill, the PBM Transparency Act, um, would require PBMs to disclose complete ag- the complete aggregate amount of compensation received from prescription drug manufacturers and other payments or credits re- retained by the PBM. And the House has similarly passed bills requiring PBMs to provide employers and health plans with information on prescription drug spending. So I think generally large employers support strong transparency. I think one of um, when their concerns is that they just think um, PBM reform needs to go further. Um, mm-hmm. So while they're supportive of transparency, I think they're looking for additional measures um, to be included to address the rise of prescription drug costs, um, including policies that address consolidation and, and bundled services that um, can drive patients to, you know, the more high profit pharmacies. So, um, so I think, um, you know, there is support for transparency, and we're probably likely to see, to see something on that included in one of the bills. Um, the prohibition on spread pricing. So spread pricing is where um, PBMs charge the plan more um, more than what the PBM pays the pharmacy for a prescription drug. Um, and then the PBM is able to sort of keep the difference, right, between what the plan pays the PBM and what the PBM paid the pharmacy. And so, um, so, so there are at least some bills, um, particularly one of the the Senate bills, the Senate PBM Reform Act, that would propose um, prohibiting spread pricing. Um, And then rebate pass-through. So rebate pass-through is the concept there is that, you know, prescription drug manufacturers will pay a rebate on prescription drugs that are purchased by plan participants, right? And so the idea is, you know, how much of that rebate gets retained by the PBM and how much of it gets passed through to the plan and ultimately makes its way, you know, back to, um, potentially back to the, the drug consumer, right? And so the idea is, in these provisions, is to sort of require PBMs to pass through 100% of the rebates and fees and other discounts that they receive from drug manufacturers back to the health plans. And I think kind of the, the key statement you made was not just rebates, but other discounts and, and amounts that are based on a percentage of the drug cost, because as we've right. seen over the years, there's been a, a narrowing and narrowing of the definition of rebate uh, in order to create other pockets of, of potential revenue and profitability uh, that even if there is a requirement for pass-through, so it's all in, you know, what 
how rebate gets defined if there's a pass-through requirement. But to your earlier point, I think, you know, if I think a lot of people, while getting transparency will be seen as a, a, a initial win from a policy reform perspective uh, around the PBM industry, many will view that as a very skinny win. Uh, you know, they want uh, some of these other a- aspects that you've talked about, as well as things like uh, prohibitions on patient steering, delinking, and additional government investigation. So, um, you know, patient steering, there's concern around the fact that uh, all the large PBMs, you know, have significant specialty pharmacy operations. Some have retail pharmacy as well. But in particular, you know, moving patients are sometimes or oftentimes on an exclusive basis, mandating use of the PBM's own specialty pharmacy, you know, creates uh, perhaps antitrust concerns around the way in which market power and platform use is happening, uh, but also perhaps create self-dealing concerns. So if if the PBM through its own specialty pharmacy is saying to manufacturers, give us larger discounts at the pharmacy and lower rebates, you know, because I have to pass the rebates along, but I get to keep all the discounts myself because I'm saying those are discounts to me. As a pharmacy owner, you see how that patient steering and, and consolidation of that um of that activity into your own owned assets or affiliated assets can be problematic. Uh, that would certainly be a much broader reform that would be more problematic uh, for the profitability of the PBM industry going forward uh, as uh, potentially delinking, which is a, 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 the notion that uh, PBM payments should not be tied uh, in any way to a percentage of a drug price, whether that's you know a percentage of rebate retention, whether that's administrative fees or other service fees or other activity or spread pricing, you know, there shouldn't be any any ability for a PBM uh, to, to link their financial uh, rewards to a percentage or based on a percentage of a drug price or a margin, that instead there should just be a, a flat fee or a, a non-percentage based fee for the activity that they're doing in terms of processing a claim or negotiating a contract. Uh, or the like. And and so that would be certainly a much more transformative reform that I'm sure, uh, you know, PBMs are advocating strongly on the Hill against, and I think is probably a, a, a higher reach in terms of actually getting that type of reform into uh, a bill at the end of this year. But I know in particular Senator Schumer and others are, are strongly advocating for that as is a life science industry uh, because of of the amount, significant amount of profitability that's captured in the middle uh, if you allow linking to, to occur. Uh, and also just from a overall investigation and oversight perspective, you know, if you think about the size of this industry and, and perhaps not having the same type of regulator that other industries of similar size and scale have at a federal level to oversee uh, you know, their activity, conduct audits, you know, provide regular guidance. There's maybe a call for that activity that maybe this fractured approach across FTC or DOJ or others just leaves too many gaps um, in the system. And there needs to be strengthened oversight of those entities, as well as potential uh, new entities or regulators that would oversee the vast amount of financial transactions that are going through the PBM industry. And so with that, I know one thing, Thing that you know may or may not make it is is this notion of some form of fiduciary obligation. Kendra, I, I know you know employers in particular uh, have been voicing the need for some form of fiduciary standard. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit and why sure. that's so important? Sure. Some employers would like to see PBMs be subject to a fiduciary standard that will require PBMs to conduct their business in a manner that puts the best interests of plans in their enrollees first, right? And the goal is to impose a standard of conduct on PBMs to discourage practices that are perceived as increasing drug costs and spending. I mean, I feel like we're sort of right now in a little bit of a -a whack-a-mole situation, right? Where, you know, every time some bad behavior pops up or behavior that people think is bad, you know, they feel like they have to go run to the legislature to get a law passed to prohibit it, right? And so I think the theory here is, well, if they're subject to the same standard of conduct, you know, um, as employers are when they're plan fiduciaries to their prime participants, um, then for then, you know, then there'd be more alignment in the interests and maybe, you know, it would prevent like some behaviors from arising that would later have to be addressed, you know, on some sort of statutory initiative. Um, 
So I do think that, you know, employers had hoped that the proposed PBM legislation that's, you know, um, uh, circulating on the Hill right now would include fiduciary requirements for PBMs. So far, the only provision touching on this um, is in the Senate Health Committee's PBM Reform Act, which merely instructs the Department of Labor to study PBMs fiduciary responsibilities. And I think one of the possible reasons that we haven't yet seen a fiduciary provision included in legislation that is that it's potentially difficult to reach consensus on some aspects of it. You know, for example, if a PBM has an exclusive obligation to act in the best interests of participants and beneficiaries, which is, you know, the ERISA fiduciary standard, um, then presumably the legislation has to include a carve out, right, that would allow PBMs to still receive reasonable compensation for their services. I mean, I don't think, you know, I think people want PBMs to be in business, they provide useful services, right? So we need to find a way, but then it's, well, how would reasonable compensation be defined? And does Congress want to be in the business of defining it, right? So, um, so I think it's just going to become a question of, you know, what, what, you know, how do we come up with a standard that, you know, can be measured and is enforceable? Um, and that, you know, sort of achieves the goal of maybe, you know, just kind of, um, you know, sort of, creating a more alignment of, of the interests of some of the, the consumers of the prescription drugs with right. PBMs. I've long thought, I think the, the, you know, the notion of creating an ERISA fiduciary standard may be a bridge too far, especially <laughs> in the term, uh, just to get consensus if they're trying to get something passed. But it doesn't mean there can't be prohibition, basic prohibitions on things like self-dealing, right. uh, you know, that wouldn't require uh, necessarily, you know, reaching into ERISA and the complexity of, of, of working through there. So I'm still hopeful that we'll see some form of maybe light fiduciary standard, uh, at least, you know, on, on self-dealing in particular as a platform company uh, could be really beneficial uh, to patients and, and many other stakeholders uh, in the system. Um, you know, I think it's important for us to, 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 to turn and, and kind of close on this notion of, of state activity in this area. And I know you mentioned this notion of, of, of kind of play whack-a-mole on all these different areas that that the PBMs are involved in because of their vertical integration. I'll mention uh, uh, the chapter five of, of the treatise that we talked about earlier has a really helpful chart on all the different profit levers that PBMs have across the different stakeholders uh, that they deal with. And so that can be a really helpful level setting for those that aren't as familiar with, with each aspect uh, of, the, of the profit stream, as well as some examples of how a drug moves through the system and, and who keeps what percentage of it um, and it can be really enlightening. But I know on the state level, there's one, you know, a, a, Clearly, you know, PBMs have been have been fighting back on whether it's the, the state AG efforts uh, and investigations, but also some of these statutes that they feel have gone too far uh, and, and violate existing law. And I think in particular, the Tenth Circuit's decision um, about the Oklahoma law could be really helpful. And so why don't we close on you, you talking about, um, about that decision and how that kind of pulled back the ability to do PBM reform in certain areas. Right. So the, the case is PCMA versus Mul Mulready. Um, and in that case, what happened is the Oklahoma passed a statute um, that would have required PBMs to be subject to retail pharmacy network access standards and would have prohibited PBMs, you know, from promoting in network pharmacies by offering cost sharing discounts and also using their mail order pharmacies to satisfy some of the retail network standards. Um, it also include a included a provision that said that PBMs cannot deny a provider the opportunity to participate in a pharmacy network um, at preferred status if they're willing to accept the terms and conditions of participating in the network. And it also included a provision that said that PBMs can't deny, limit, or terminate a provider's contract based on the employment status of an employee who has an active license to dispense um, despite pro despite probation status. So in other words, you know, if the pharmacy has someone on, who's on probation status, then, you know, it would have prevented um, the PBM from excluding that pharmacy from the network. Um, so PCMA sued to enjoin the law from taking effect on grounds that it's preempted by ERISA and Medicare Part D. And the parties then filed dueling motions of summary judgment in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision in Rutledge. Um, in Rutledge, the Supreme Court held um, an Arkansas PBM regulation that governed PBM pharmacy reimbursements rate was not preempted by ERISA. 
And by way of background, you know, ERISA preempts state laws that relate to, you know, employee benefit plans. Um, and a state law relates to an, an ERISA plan if it has a connection with, with or reference to an ERISA plan. So in Rutledge, the court stated that this boils down to asking whether the state law governs a central matter of plan administration or interferes with nationally uniform plan administration. Um, and in Rutledge, the Supreme Court upheld the Arkansas PBM regulation um, because it determined that the Arkansas statute, although it might increase cost to plans by requiring PBMs to pay pharmacies at least the acquisition cost of a drug, um, it didn't affect the ability of employers to structure their employee benefit plans in a certain manner, right? So in Rutledge, the court said, look, this is not preempted by ERISA. So in the wake of that, the district court, you know, held that ERISA did not preempt the Oklahoma statute. Um, it did held that, that Medicare Part D preempted some of the challenge provisions, but it largely held that ERISA did not. Um, and the district court reasoned that the law was not preempted because it merely alters the incentives, but doesn't force ERISA plans to make specific choices, right? And so for example, for the network access provisions, they said, well, that doesn't prohibit using mail order pharmacies. It just says that you can't, they don't count towards meeting the access standards. So that's not, you know, they're saying that doesn't really affect it, you know, administration. Um, and they said the any willing provider statute, it doesn't require the plan to accept any pharmacy into the network. It just relates to whether the pharmacy has preferred status or not. Um, and then on the prohibition standard, um, or the probation standard, they said, well, that only relates to contracts between providers and PBMs, and that has a de minimis effect on pharmacy benefit design. So, so then, the, of course, the case gets appealed right to the 10th Circuit, and the 10th Circuit says, well, wait a minute here. We do think that these laws are preempted, and here's why. First of all, you know, for the any willing provider standard, you know, we've by increasing the potential providers and directly, we, we are directly affecting the administration of the plans because we're essentially forcing them to go to a single tier network. Um, because if you can't preclude a plan from, you know, you know, if, if you're, if you, if the plan is precluded from excluding providers from a network, then you're essentially, you know, no longer allowing it to have a preferred pharmacy network and you're sort of eventually collapsing it into a single tier. Um, and on the network adequacy, again, it said, you know, this does affect, you know, plan administration because, you know, you are dictating which pharmacies must, must be included in the network. You're requiring cost sharing to be the same for all of the in-network pharmacies, which is key and fundamental to benefit designs. Um, and pharmacy networks, the, the Tenth Circuit was, the, you know, reasoned are a cornerstone of the benefit design. And, you know, and the network restrictions don't say anything about PBM costs, right? So they just felt like these clearly are a target to network design. Um, and on the probation prohibition, again, you know, the argument is, um, you know, the 10th Circuit sort of disagreed with the district court's reasoning that the state laws have only a de minimis effect plan on plan design are not preempted because they're like, that's never been a standard. <laughs> they're like, you know, de minimis effect on plan design is not the Supreme Court's test for determining whether something is preempted by ERISA. Um, and so there they are just saying, look, you know, the, the probation prohibition forces PBMs to capitulate to all, you know, including all pharmacies in their network. Um, even those employing pharmacists on probations. And they're like, look, we can't, you know, we, again, that goes to sort of dictating the design of someone's network. And that is not something that, you know, and that goes to the heart of administration and therefore is preempted by ERISA. I mean, I think one of the other really interesting points in the case is that one of the arguments that Oklahoma have tried to make is that, well, no, the state laws are regulating PBMs. They're not, regu they're not reg regulating plans. And therefore, this doesn't relate to employee benefit plans. And so the Tenth Circuit did spend some time discussing how because of you know, it is almost virtually or very difficult for a plan to self-administer the functions that a PBM provides. The PBM is almost synonymous to the plan and it has to be analyzed, you know, as essentially the plan in the context of an ERISA preemption analysis. So I thought that was just a really interesting, 
you know, point that they focused on in the case about how, and they cited some other case law and precedent for that, you know, where HMOs are often synonymous to plans. Um, and there have been other cases, so there was case precedent for it. But I think this is the first time that a court has actually talked about how PBMs are, you know, synonymous to plans in many ways. And so I thought that that was just, you know, very interesting. Um, and then, you know, not really my area of focus, but the 10th Circuit also ruled that the any willing provider provision is preempted by Medicare Part D as well. So um, that was just another yeah, aspect of that. I mean, this case is a great reminder that while there's a, a strong appetite for PBM reform across a lot of different levers, you're often going to run into sometimes a brick wall of risk of preemption and having PBMs rely on that, have they had, as they have for decades, to win a number of cases. And certainly the Supreme Court uh, opened up some aperture uh, in Rutledge for, for further reform, but things need to happen in line with that decision. And maybe we'll see further cases that hold a little differently and then it gets back to the Supreme Court. Um, so it is certainly going to be an area of contentious debate in terms of what the, what the, um, how far you could go on PBM reform and not run into ERISA preemption issues uh, that that that, um, that that pull it back. Um, I also think you're going to see uh, more activity at the state AG level. Um, you know where the insurance commissioners haven't perhaps been as active. The state AGs will say, you know, we we think uh, we've got authority to look here and do more, such as Ohio in particular has led the way. Uh, and in some ways, the platform PBMs is uh, in particular ones that are vertically integrated one can make the argument that the PBM is really engaged in the practice of insurance and that state insurance commissioners should be more uh, active because they've got state authority to, to regulate them as an insurer uh, and, and part of a consolidated PBM insurer enterprise. And I think if the state commissioners, uh, insurance commissioners don't do that, I think the state AGs will do more of that. And so, you know, it's going to play out across all these different landscapes of the states, the federal level, uh, agencies such as FTC and DOJ, and it's just an area that 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 uh, folks would need to, to pay careful attention to, and really see and predict what's coming around the corner to advise clients appropriately as to what's in the near term, what are the implications of that, what's more medium term, long term, uh, and and when do we think that'll happen, and what's the likelihood of that, and then how are different PBMs coming up to solve for some of these issues and creating more innovative models, maybe ones where they don't take a percentage, they don't keep the rebate or, or don't uh, tie their compensation as a percentage of drug pricing. So that's another area to advise and be mindful of. But this has been a fantastic discussion. I think it's been a great uh, um, springboard off of that, the chapter five that you and I worked on closely uh, in the HLA treatise on market access and drug pricing. And I think we're just thankful for you and I to be able to connect again uh, in a different venue and uh, you know appreciate the partnership and look forward to future events like this with you. Great, thanks so much, Rujul, likewise. And thanks to everyone for joining us.